Good evening from the KPNW News Radio, 1120 AM, 93.7 FM Studios. I'm Bill London, co-host of The Wake Up Call. Heard weekdays, 6 a.m. to 9, on those fine radio stations and also on the World Wide Web. This look at the news brought to you by Dr. Michael Bratland of Chris Dental, where if you call them today, they'll see you today. Well, we have to start with what is a huge tragedy. The search of the wildfire wreckage on the Hawaiian island of Maui today has revealed a wasteland of burned out homes and obliterated communities as firefighters battled that stubborn blaze that has now claimed over 36 lives, making it the deadliest in the U.S. in recent years. It was fueled by a dry summer and strong winds from a passing hurricane, and the fire started Tuesday, took the island by surprise. Racing through the parched growth and neighborhoods in the historic town of Lahaina, a tourist destination that dates back to the 1700s, it's the biggest community on the island's west side. Maui County said late Wednesday that at least 36 people had died, making it the deadliest U.S. blaze since, of course, the infamous 2018 campfire in California that killed 85 people and completely obliterated the town of Paradise. They believe the Hawaii toll could rise. Rescuers are trying to reach parts of the island that have been unreachable due to the ongoing fires or other obstructions. At this point, at least 271 structures have been damaged or destroyed and dozens of people have been injured. U.S. mortgage rates remain elevated this week, rising for the third week in a row and staying just under the market's 7% threshold. The 30-year fixed rate mortgage averaged 6.96% in the week ending August 10th. That's up from 6.9% the week before. That according to data from Freddie Mac released this morning. A year ago, the 30-year fixed rate was 5.2%. The average mortgage rate, of course, is based on mortgage applications that Freddie Mac receives from thousands of lenders across the country. The survey includes only borrowers who put 20% down and have excellent credit. The rate stayed elevated this week after the Federal Reserve highlighted its reliance on data on jobs and inflation in its July monetary policy meeting. And of course, in their recent comments, markets have been waiting for July's inflation report, which was also released this morning, and it showed that consumer price hikes rose 3.2% annually, the first increase in 12 months. The data also showed the shelter costs contributed 90% of total inflation last month. While jurors rejected writer and reporter Andy No's attempt to hold two left-wing activists accountable for a beating he received after going undercover at one of Portland's nightly protest riots in 2021. After a years-long battle, Multnomah County jury, uh, jury delivered a verdict clearing activists John Hacker and Elizabeth Richter of all civil liability. Circuit Judge Shanponi Sinalapasi didn't immediately award attorney's fees to Hacker and Richter. She also did not determine what penalties, if any, are going to be required of three defendants who never responded to the lawsuit and didn't even show up in court, so they lost by default. She may rule later on those issues. While both activists admitted that they had seen through the disguise and posted on social media about No's whereabouts, neither physically assaulted the author as he made a wild flight for safety into a downtown hotel May 28th of 2021. Right now, it's not known if No plans to appeal. He first drew controversy writing about politics and religion for the Portland State University Vanguard and then later was a contributor to the Wall Street Journal. No had sought a combined $300,000 from Hacker and Richter, including more than $115,000 for his relocation to London, arguing their actions had made it impossible for him to continue his on-the-ground reporting about the city's social strife. On May 28th of 2021, No attended a protest dressed incognito, trying to blend in with the crowd, but he was outed by Hacker, who testified that No's jet black ski goggles and Black Lives Matter cape stood out in the small crowd gathered downtown outside the Multnomah Justice Center. After Hacker made the discovery, a quartet of demonstrators clad in black ripped No's mask off and attacked him tackling him and kicking him before he reached a safe harbor behind the concierge desk at the Nines Hotel. 
Richter eventually entered the hotel lobby and taunted No while live streaming, promising a harsher beating in the future. Governor Tina Kotek is encouraging district attorneys and community corrections directors to contact her office directly when someone whose sentence has been commuted violates the conditions of their release in a manner that warrants revocation of their commutation. Kotek claims she'll review each case individually based on the facts of the case with an aim to keep communities safe. Now, this comes amid renewed scrutiny of the commutation and post-prison supervision, or lack of it, of 38-year-old Jesse Lee Calhoun. He's been linked to the murders of four women whose bodies were found in wooded areas earlier this year in Multnomah, Clackamas, and Polk counties. Calhoun was among 41 prisoners whose sentences then-Governor Kate Brown commuted as a thank you for helping fight the wildfires in 2020. He'd been convicted of assaulting an officer and unauthorized use of a motor vehicle and burglary, but he has a crime, a string of crimes that go back long before that. He, by the way, is among four revocation requests that Kotek has approved since January 19th. Among them, Timothy Lepish, who after being released, is accused of first-degree theft related to stealing from the Apple Store in Portland. Another, Chad Southwell, who's accused of possession of a stolen vehicle and unauthorized use of a vehicle in Multnomah County. Then you have William Miskell, who just left the state. Didn't even say where he was going. That violated his conditions of parole. And Kristen Sefuentes Roblero, who is accused in Clackamas County of aggravated identity theft. Brown, if you recall, enthusiastically embraced her broad clemency authority, waving her magic scepter and freeing over a thousand people, granting the commutations and turning them free as part of her prison reform plan. Well, the 10 Republican state senators in Oregon who racked up more than 10 unexcused absences during a walkout in the most recent legislative session cannot run for re-election in 2024, at least according to the state's elections chief. Oregon Secretary of State LaVon griffin Vallad made the announcement. Under Measure 113 approved by voters last year, lawmakers with more than 10 unexcused absences were supposed to be disqualified for being re-elected for the following term. But Republicans raised questions over the measure's vague wording, sparking confusion over what the consequences of the walkout would actually be for the boycotting senators. But the text of the measure which is now part of the state constitution, says disqualification applies to the term following the election after the member's current term is completed. Now, according to Republicans, that means that boycotters who are up for re-election next year could still be candidates despite having over 10 absences because their current term ends in January of 2025 with a disqualification coming for the 2028 election. Well, Griffin Vlade's office said that the secretary found no suggestion prior to enactment in the voters' pamphlet, media, or otherwise that the measure was understood or intended to allow absent legislators to serve an additional term after accumulating too many absences and then be disqualified the term after that. Now, courts have found that the text of adopted ballot measures must be interpreted according to the voters' intent. How do you prove that? Republican Oregon Senator uh, Senator and Minority Leader Tim Canope says, we'll see in court. And Oregon lawmakers this year quietly approved a $90 million cost overrun for a capital renovation project that's the state capital renovation project, ratcheting up spending by about 25% without any public notice. The new expenses were uncovered in budget bills passed late in the legislative session and were not mentioned in committee hearings or outlined in written testimony. The measures expecting taxpayers to pay nearly $465 million for a $375 million job were approved and voted on by legislators without any discussion. The state's top two lawmakers said explaining the cost overruns in public hearings 
wasn't warranted. House Speaker Dan Rayfield's office, Democrat House Speaker Dan Rayfield's office, said that the Capitol renovation received attention when it was okayed last session and that even an increase approaching $100 million didn't merit mention. They said that capital projects typically incur normal shifts in cost estimates, and so updates to the initial estimate were anticipated. By who? Senate President Rob Wagner, the Democrat from Lake Oswego, in a statement said that the increased spending followed their regular review procedure, which apparently isn't any review at all. The two Democrats who control the Budget Writing Committee, along with two lawmakers who chair a subcommittee that approved the expenditure, they're not saying anything. Some Republicans have been wary about big spending on the Capitol, saying the renovation project has, be hard, has been hard to track, with Senator Tim Canope saying it's been very frustrating with a lack of transparency. He says any tax dollars need to have a conversation about why it's spent and how it's spent. Interestingly enough, the lack of transparency appears to be built into a process for funding state construction projects that doesn't demand that officials account for escalating costs. Budget writers, it turns out, knew about the hikes, and it wasn't made a part of the public record because no member of the Budget Committee asked for a public explanation. Well, how's that for oversight for your budget? I wish I had just $90 million that I could spend without asking my wife. This look at the news brought to you by... Our friends at Chris Dental, Dr. Michael Bratlin. Rick, get real.